Hello, good evening and welcome back to the IEA channel and to this evening's episode of The Definite Article. I'm Emily Carver, the Head of Media at the Institute of Economic Affairs. In today's uh, episode, I'm joined by two guests. I'll be joined by the IEA's Director General Mark Littlewood Hello, and also Hello, Professor uh, Len Shackleton, IEA Editorial and Research Fellow. We'll be discussing Mark's latest column for The Times out today, there are better ways than state aid to help Fatima find her feet. And this is inspired by a new IEA paper by Len called How to Create New Jobs. Before we begin, please do click the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. It helps other people to find our channel and find all our content. And if you're watching live uh, this evening, please don't hesitate to put a question in the chat box. I'll do my best to ask Len and Mark what you'd like me to. So uh, before we start, uh, you can also find a link to Mark's column in the description box, and you can also find a link to Len's new paper, as well as a three minute short explainer about uh, how we can create jobs uh, with Len. So this evening, we're going to be talking about jobs, as I said, and uh, with the coronavirus job retention scheme unwinding at the end of the month, this is going to be a hot topic. Um, some forecasts are now estimating up to 3 million people could be left jobless once this crisis has passed. Of course, these are just estimates, but it's clear that this is going to be high up on the political agenda. But how do we go about boosting employment post-COVID? Len's recent report makes the case for encouraging the creation of new roles rather than holding on to old ones or keeping old businesses on artificial life support. This, he argues, means relaxing regulation and allowing private enterprise to drive the recovery. Mark argues in his uh, column today that we'll need to find a public policy framework that allows vast numbers of workers to find new employment and explore alternative careers. Uh, this will be through fostering a liberalized, vibrant private sector, as he puts it, not through big government. So um, thank you for joining me, Len and Mark. Evening, Emily. This will be through fostering a liberalised, vibrant private sector, as he puts it, not through. So I'm back. Sorry for that little pause. Um, Len, if maybe I ask you the first question, um, I'd like to step back a little bit in time. You describe in your new briefing paper how before the pandemic hit, the UK had been doing pretty well relatively in terms of generating new private sector jobs. What were we doing then or not doing as the case may be that made us have a relatively strong and agile, flexible labor market? I think, uh, Emily, compared with a, a lot of European countries, uh, the UK has managed to maintain uh, a reasonably open labor market, a reasonably flexible labor market. And it's really been very successful in creating jobs over a long period. We, we, I, I'm very interested in the dynamics of labour markets. And, uh, you know, when, when you focus on things like the level of unemployment, uh, that's, that's really rather mystifying in a sense, because the labour market is chopping and changing all the time. In the course of, of, of a year um, prior to the pandemic, uh, we were losing uh, about two million jobs a year, but we were gaining... Uh, uh, more than two million, and so we were gradually creating more and more employment as time went on. You must bear in mind that the labour market is always losing jobs. Uh, people are always uh, being displaced, uh, taste change, business models fail, uh, and all that kind of stuff. And so we've got to we've got to maintain a labour market which is open, dynamic, and flexible. And what I'm arguing for in this paper is that what we mustn't do is sort of panic and assume that the government has to do everything. The government must try to stop jobs being lost. Government must try to pump more and more money in. Boris, Boris has uh, spoken, Boris Johnson has spoken of a new deal for Britain. He's obviously got uh, mm -hmm. Franklin Roosevelt on his mind when he says that kind of thing. But of, of course, the, 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 uh, the New Deal episode in the United States was not the, the great success that's often painted by people on the left. Uh, in fact, by, by uh, you know, after, after um, Roosevelt had been in office for, for nearly seven years at the outbreak of, 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 of the uh, of Second World War, um, uh, there was still 15% unemployment in, 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 
in the United States, whereas we brought it down. So I, what I'm arguing for is that we should look very carefully before we say, let's pump more money in, let's spend more as the solution to things. Mark, we've got an interesting question in the uh, chat already. Um, Clive Hamilton's asking, why has there been no second wave in China? China has a V-shaped recovery and they're useless communists. So have we seen a V-shaped recovery in China? They seem to be doing pretty well in terms of their uh, GDP and output. Well, the I mean, the recovery is going to be based on when we stop uh, restrictions on business, right? So we've we've had if if you looked at the uk economy as a patient i guess you could say we've had a relapse okay because we had a pretty much a full on lockdown uh and uh then we started liberalizing and now we put the economy back into special measures not as strict as they were over the spring and summer uh but nevertheless pretty strict and uh i mean i echo len's thoughts here it's worth saying that the british labor market performs pretty well has done historically but my concern now is, let's imagine, I mean, I'm not a forecaster, but 3 million people are displaced from their present jobs uh, as a result of the, the lockdown, um, some businesses becoming non-viable. Uh, this is really going to test, I guess, our flexibility to the maximum. How quickly can we find new work for these people? Um, now, obviously, you want a prevailing uh, health in the economy in order to find that, but you also need a very flexible labour market. And Len is right, and this is what worries me, that the government's approach to this seems to be top down, central planning, we'll have new schemes, we'll hire 13,000 work coaches. I mean, the, the, the idea that you might finally, everybody has a job trying to find everybody else a job seems to be uh, the, the logic behind that. Um, but there seems to be precious little. In fact, I might go so far as say there's nothing, but Len might correct me on that, to make it easier for the private sector to act in a flexible fashion. Uh, the IA, you know, so far has come out of this crisis in fairly rude health. What's the government doing to uh, encourage me to take on three or four more employees, possibly on short term contracts, because we might just be wanting to dip our toe in the waters. We don't really know how things will go. And at the moment, those strictures are worse from a business point of view, discourage experimentation. It's a big decision to take on an employee. Uh, I think we're still bound by the agency worker rule that if I take on an agency worker for more than 12 months, they can become a permanent employee. And then there's quite a lot of risks to the business um, if you want to make them a redundant down the line. So like everything else, if you make the price of labor expensive, people will generally consume less of it. And the government's approach at the moment doesn't seem to be to liberalize anything I can think of in the private sector. It's just going to be endless apprenticeship schemes and uh, work coaches and, and you know, uh, schemes to give youngsters on universal credit, a, 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 you know, a slot on the ladder. Now, those might do some good, but I don't think they're an optimal use of resources. And at least uh, another half, a bigger half, is uh, allowing the private sector to act in a flexible fashion. And there's none of that that I can detect. Uh, I could detect a lot of it in Len's paper, which I heartily applaud, but very little of it coming from the mouths of government ministers. Yeah, Mark, your, uh, the hook for your latest article in The Times today, um, just a reminder to people watching that you can, uh, you, there's a link in the description box to that. Um, the hook for the article was a uh, government-sponsored advert that was doing the rounds on uh, social media last week. It uh, showed a picture of a young ballet dancer called Fatima and the caption asserted that her next job would be in cyber. Um, you noted in your article that the main reaction, at least on social media, was uh, that the state clearly isn't doing enough to support jobs, that there must be more state intervention, not less. It seems that the government um, has sort of bought into the idea that you can not only top down manage the economy in terms of, in terms of putting it on ice and then resuscitating it, but you can also as you say, um, create jobs that way through big fat government schemes um, that are run by uh, Whitehall and, and others. Um, do you think that the message there is completely uh, negative in that advert? You know, surely retra retraining in some respect is a positive thing, or do you think it should be completely left to the market, this sort of um, attempt to get people back into work? Well, I mean, the, the, 
the the advertisement offended me for completely the opposite reasons that it seemed to offend everybody else. Uh, that most people that were offended seemed to take the view that if this Fatima girl wanted to be a ballet dancer, then it was no one's business to tell her that she couldn't be, irrespective of whether there was no demand for ballet dancers or a surfeit of ballet dancers. If Fatima, in her wisdom, wants to be a ballet dancer, a ballet dancer she will be, come hell or high water. And the equity trade unions said, went so far as to say that the only problem she faces is insufficient government subsidy to be a ballet dancer. Well, if, you know, we, we, we do need to sort of pick jobs that are actually productive. I don't know whether, the, I mean, I presume at the moment the demand for ballet dancers is virtually zero, but I have no idea whether that will go up or down in the next two or three years. What I was offended by was the suggestion that Fatima herself couldn't work this out. The suggestion was her next job would be in cyber, brackets, she just doesn't know it yet. However, there is presumably some brilliant civil servant work coach sitting deep in some denizens of some government department who knows exactly what Fatima is going to do with the rest of her life and is going to centrally plan her career for her. That's what offended me, that it's far, far better to allow Fatima to pursue her own dreams. She might not be able to, maybe she's not good enough. Maybe not enough people want to watch ballet and too many people want to perform in ballet. But uh, the what I was offended by was the suggestion that she doesn't know it. We don't know what's best for us, but somewhere at the, um, I can't remember which department it was, I think it might have been DCMS this one, it was Oliver Dowden who commented on it, but somewhere in some government department, Emily, they know exactly what you're going to have to do with the rest of your career and they'll have a government scheme to make sure you damn well do it. That's what I found offensive. Yeah, yeah, that wasn't what was uh, most talked about on social media, unfortunately. It was all about yeah, more state support, more state money, more public money um, mm. to get people back to work. But Len, this is a rather big question and you've sort of hinted at what your view might be. But do you think the government could have saved more jobs um, if they'd followed a different strategy from the start? Do you think they were right to begin with, at least? Well, I don't think it's a, a question we necessarily want to get into tonight, but uh, the 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 whole way in which the lockdown has been handled, and indeed this kind of competitive lockdown business, which we're now getting with this ludicrous lockdown in Wales and Keir Starmer demanding that we lock down uh, the whole the whole of England. Um, you know, government has destroyed a lot of jobs. It's very good at destroying jobs. It's, 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 not, a, it's not quite as good as crea creating them, except in a very superficial sense of taking on 13,000 work coaches or whatever. Um, I, I worry about the, the, where we're going, not, o not only the, the kind of spending which is being contemplated on these schemes, which is colossal, and which will be a continuing uh, cost to the economy, but also the, the, the general attitude to labour market regulation. I know it's a bit under the, under the net, nobody's really noticing this stuff at the, uh, at the moment, but we have um, the, uh, the, the, the director of, uh, of labour market enforcement is Matthew Taylor, who was appointed by, by uh, Mrs May. And, and our viewers with a long memory will recall that Matthew Taylor wrote a, a report two or three years ago uh, where he, was, uh, he, he, he wants more and more regulation of the labour market. And indeed, in his report to the, um, on, on the Office of Labour Market Enforcement this year, he, he, he expresses uh, a wish to regulate in new areas, for example, in tightening the rules on self-employment, um, uh, things like that, and, and uh, possibly a home working right, uh, new, new rights for, for carers and so forth. And one of the things which is going on, I say, on, on, you know, under the screen really, is that there is going to be a single enforcement body uh, for labour market rules, which is bringing together things like the Gang Masters Authority, the National Minimum Wage Group, employment agency standards and things like that. And it's going to be a new pressure group for yet more labour market regulation. And that's completely the opposite direction in which we should be going in my view. I think we should take as our inspiration, not Franklin Roosevelt and the, and the big spending New Deal, but uh, the, 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 the way in which Germany uh, recovered from the awful uh, conditions at the end of the Second World War by letting the market rip, basically, by, uh, you know, with Ludwig Erhardt and, and, and various other auto liberals uh, saying, let's free up markets and, and this will be the driver of our recovery. And I think that's the inspiration which we need. We can argue the toss about particular forms of 
uh, employment regulation, you know, a little bit more, a little bit less here and there. But the general drift, in my view, has to be towards greater liberalisation if we're to create the kind of atmosphere where new jobs uh, can be generated by the private sector. Mark, you both um, call for less burdensome regulation on employers, as uh, Len just asked. But um, doesn't it's a, probably an important question to ask, just to put to our viewers, but doesn't employment regulation exist for a reason? How can we strike the balance between overburdening employers and preventing job creation and ensuring workers are protected? Or do you think that that's not the role of the state at all to protect workers? There is also a good argument for, for protection. Um, it, it will be made loudly by interest groups who wish to promote that line. Uh, but we, we have to, you know, often, often employment uh, regulation can benefit some groups, but at the expense of others. I mean, one thing which I've been pushing and which uh, there is actually a, a, work, a, a government working party on at the moment is occupational licensing. Uh, which sounds like a good thing. We need, uh, as, as Mark said in the paper today, we need to ensure our, our brain surgeons are properly trained and so forth. But uh, the, 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 the area of, of, of medicine and so on, which is, is regulated in most countries, uh, is only a small proportion. Now it's about one in five of all workers require uh, a, a license from the government in order to undertake their work. And often this is as a result of lobbying by trade unions, professional associations, et cetera, to raise barriers to entry. And at the moment, we ought to be doing all we can to open up jobs uh, to, 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 to uh, people from, from different backgrounds, different educational qualifications and so forth. We should not be saying, for example, that all people who want to enter as, um, the estate agent business this is actually our, the, the current governor, or rather Saji Javid, who brought this in. Uh, you know, you now have to have go through a whole load of examinations and qualifications, etc., to become an estate agent. It just seems to me that that is ludicrous. We have a lot of very talented and intelligent people who are being thrown onto the labour market at the moment. It's not like the 1980s where we had a, a, a major problem of retraining people and so forth. Many of the people who've lost their jobs in this current round of stuff are people who are perfectly capable of working in a whole range of jobs, and they need to be given the opportunity to do so. Um, you know, it's not just a question of giving people basic training and how to attend an interview and things like that. Quite frankly, that's insulting to many of the people who've become unemployed, who've often held down serious managerial posts and so forth, and are now being squeezed out of the labor market through no fault of their own, Although much of the fault, I would say, lies at the door of the government. So what about, there's been a few stories running in the press. I think it's from some research that's been done by Bath University, or at least by one of the professors there. Um, they've um, talked about how up to a million young Britons could face a job crisis within a week or um, some sensationalist headline like that. But it may well be true with people coming out of university or coming out of school with no uh, immediate prospects. If you don't believe in or believe that programmes like the Kickstart scheme, which will uh, provide six, six month contracts to young pe people on uh, universal credit, um, how what's the best way of getting young people into the labour market? Is it just simply by um, making it easier for employers to employ people across the board? Or do you think there should be any targeted measures for young people? I can't see why there should be any specifically targeted measures at young people. I mean, we sort of do this within regulation and the law anyway. You know, the national minimum wage is lower for young people. So we presumably, you know, we, we've embedded a little less inflexibility in the in the labour market for young people. Um, um, then quite about the occupational licensing. The, the, the problem is when you bring it in, the incumbents have an interest to stick with it, right? I think it might have been in Len's paper, but uh, I mentioned it in my newspaper article that you know you need four years training to be a blacksmith well um it might be that if you want horseshoes put on your horse you want to go to a reputable blacksmith and you want to be sure that this person's got four years of training and five stars ever. but for that actually to be a sort of legal requirement strikes me as extremely strange and so the problem you get in extremists or in theory Imagine you said to 
that any company that takes on a worker has to guarantee that worker a full-time permanent job for 10 years. Uh, you might uh, applaud that we have given people very stable employment, but my God, you would have to risk you took somebody on that you really wanted to take them on. You know, the, the IEA would take on fewer staff if that was the, the rule. It isn't the rule. I'm just, I'm just illustrating that the tighter the obligation, the bigger the burdens on um, labor, and particularly amongst young people, you want to give people the opportunity to do six weeks work, eight weeks work, something like that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll come and trial you. You're not necessarily a full contract of employment. Uh, really extreme flexibility as, as people are, you know, trying to work out what their careers are. When you're long in the tooth like Len and myself, perhaps you're searching for something different. But if you're just leaving university, you might want to file a few before a, a, a period of time. Uh, so I think flexibility is, is the way to go. And there is going to be, you know, an enormous reallocation of labour. And at the moment, the government thinks it can oversee that, whereas I would have thought the best solution is largely for the government to get out of the yeah. business to, to find the best opportunities. So, Len, um, if we look at some of the sectors that have been most, well, harshly impacted by coronavirus and all the lockdown restrictions that have come um, to uh, ameliorate the situation or so um, we're told, um, which sectors do you think simply won't recover? Should the government be there to ease the pain at all at the moment? You know, all the pubs, restaurants that may well never reopen, should they sort of just be left to um, left to, to suffer the consequences of the, of the government's, uh, well, uncertain restrictions, continuous changing of the goalposts? I guess that's a question that also brings in the lockdown, but it's hard to separate the two. Um, what do you think when it comes to that? Do you think that the government should just be allowing these businesses to collapse? It's a very difficult question, Emily, because, uh, you know, you, you, you want, there is an argument for saying the government should continue to support businesses which are locked down but will recover. But it's very difficult to identify which these would be. And if you're not careful, you end up with, with supporting all sorts of activities which are never going to go back to uh, their previous. So it's, it's, it's pretty clear to me that, it, first of all, it's going to be a lot longer to get out of this situation than people think. There's so much hope placed in a vaccine and the belief that if we just keep locking down and locking down again and locking down again, sooner or later, the vaccine will ride over the hill and save us all. It's not going to be like that. Even when we get a vaccine, it's going to be a long process of getting it out and uh, the, the, you know, it will have a limited effect at first and so forth. And the point is that people are going to be continuing to socially distance and, and, and stay away from large uh, events, conferences, theatres, uh, sporting occasions and so forth and you know it's, it's just very difficult to see how we can keep on these businesses indefinitely people will have to repurpose and have to do things differently but perhaps I could just go back because uh, because of the breakup of, of Mark we rather lost the point about this uh, million young people I must say that this is a report uh, written by Paul Gregg who's a very distinguished labour market economist I've got a lot of time for he has a, a obviously a leftist slant on this one of the things which uh, you know worries me about this yes we've got it we've got a, a, a lot of young people becoming un unemployed but what are we going to do about it and the, the only answer from government seems to be top-down schemes and we've been through these kind of job training schemes many many times I, you know I, I'm, I'm older than you lot right I, I was <laughs> right stuff arguing about this stuff uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, and so on. So I know these kind of schemes. Uh, that they, they, they can succeed with some groups if they're clearly defined and properly focused and so forth. But these kind of general make-work schemes, job subsidy schemes and so on, will not produce lasting jobs. And indeed, uh, they, they, they may well actually, if they're not handled right, may actually stigmatise young people who take part in them because, you know, people, employers will see them as being so hopeless that they can't get a job on their own, that they've gone through these kinds of things. That sort of thing has happened in the past, and we need to be very wary. Now, I think we can give, we, we can think in terms of, of, of uh, helping young people, but I think it's got to 
put the responsibility on them in a sense. I would like to see, for example, instead of apprenticeship schemes, which are employers deciding things and so forth, we ought, if, if there is money to be spent in this, it should be put into the hands of young people in terms of vouchers or, or, or sums of money which can be applied to retraining jobs which young people choose to retrain for. And this might also include, uh, for, for the many graduates who, who are being out onto the market, subsidies towards uh, doing higher qualifications or, or, or moving into, into teaching or to a, a, a range of areas which they could do. At the moment, the, the idea seems to be, we know best, we will provide these schemes uh, and, and young people will just have to either take them or not take them. And I think that's wrong. Yeah, I know in your previous in a previous paper by by you, Len, you um, were talking about uh, talking about how the office is changing, um, how people will still need to go into the office, you are arguing, and that we may well not see a dramatic change. But of course, a lot of businesses are still running remotely. A lot of people aren't going into the office. I have friends who, you know, have massive offices of 500 plus people and only a tiny fraction of people are now going into the office and I wonder if that's to come. I think that that will have um, really devastating effects on young people and their career progression for the next few years. You know, every day counts when you're in your yeah. 20s or just starting out your career and getting that expertise from older people and learning from your colleagues is is essential yeah. to get forward and to get promoted and all of those different, different things. So hopefully, I hope that we'll go back to more business as usual in terms of office work. Luckily at the IEA, we're mostly back. Um, <laughs> has there been anything that's changed in a positive direction when it comes to the labour market um, and regulation and, and all yes. that we're talking about in the last, sort of before this pandemic? That we yes, can that has been. That's been. Um, uh, the, I mean, what I wonder, uh, Len was uh, mentioning Matthew Taylor, Matthew Taylor earlier, who I know a little bit. I don't mm. want to place all the blame at his door. But I do wonder on labour market regulations, in addition to the incumbency effect that, you know, that people who are inside the labour market often have an incentive to make it harder for people to compete with them. But I also think there's an awful lot of everybody getting offended on behalf of everybody else. If you look at the gig economy, from what we can tell, you know, Uber drivers and the like love the flexibility. Now, the TUC might be coming in and saying, oh, this is terribly insecure and not safe. And, you know, we need to, we, we want traditional nine to five jobs that you do for 45 years and then get given a carriage clock at the end. But it seems that the people who actually participate in this more flexible style of working, be that zero hours contracts, um, be that working in the gig economy, sort of pick your hours and you get paid by the hour, uh, you work for a range of employers, all of whom are apps on your mobile phone. By and large, these people seem to like it. I'm not saying that none of them would, would you know, would, would want a more permanent or secure job, but a good number of them like it. So I'm wondering whether actually the best advocates of flexible working will be those who actually go down that path. And the people who are opposed to it don't seem to be those who are actually engaged in it. They seem to be people who are offended on behalf of the people who are engaged in it. And that, that I think is a wonderful development. I mean, I can see a world in the future, I hate to make a uh, forecast, but where basically being self-employed is the norm. And mm. you, you know, you, Emily, will do, you know, certain work for the IA, which will logged on an app and you're paid for that. You might do certain works for other people and you'll be paid through Emily Carver Limited. Uh, and it will be very, very easy to hire people on that basis. Technology is making that possible. And that seems to me, by and large, a, a good thing. Yes, it doesn't give you uh, predictability. But the predictability of working down a coal mine for 40 years of your life was not necessarily a particularly pleasant predictability. It gives you flexibility and opportunity and, and, and the rest of it. And that might not be for everybody, but it probably is um, welcomed by millions of workers. And it seems to be welcomed by those who are engaging in those processes. Yeah, well, just, that's very oh. interesting. Uh, Emily, your new contract is in the post. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, I think that that is a, a positive development, uh, Mark. Uh, the, the, you know, whenever a, a big change like this happens, there are unexpected consequences which pop up. I mean, one which has occurred to me, it occurred to me when I was talking to students today in a, in a, in a discussion, was that uh, if, you, if, if you are going to have more homeworking, um, you're going to be able to recruit from a, a wider pool. 
uh, it's not just going to be people who can get into, into Canary Wharf or somewhere, right? It's going to be people all over the country, potentially. And this might actually be an opportunity for people in uh, regions which, uh, you know, which are very depressed at the moment with high unemployment rates and so forth, to actually obtain work in a way which would not have been possible before. You couldn't commute from, I don't know, Grimsby to, to London or somewhere, but you can work at home in Grimsby. Uh, and, and, you know, on the same basis. Now, that implies, of course, that there will be much greater competition uh, for, for posts. Um, you know, we've already heard these stories of, you know, two or three thousand applications for one, one post. If uh, really your market is the entire country, or indeed, of course, rather more frighteningly, is the whole world for some types of job, then you're going to find a much more competitive labour market. And maybe some of these older structures uh, will we'll begin to cave in under the, the impact of a, a dynamic labour market. Yeah, I can imagine, though, if, if jobs become sort of available to the entire world, job adverts, essentially, if people can work remotely, I imagine that will also lead to um, protectionism in a way, as people try to protect, as the government attempts to protect jobs for um, British people only. Um, I can imagine there could be a lot of political contention if that becomes sort of the case ongoing um but just finally we've had a couple of questions just to finish that are on the chat um one is will the pubs be open at christmas not strictly relevant but um an interesting one and from charlie which sp sp specific regulation to reduce labor costs would the panel get rid of apart from licensing well shall, shall i try on charlie's question yeah uh, i mean i've got a whole range of radical proposals but but one that might be somewhere within the broad orbit of the politically possible is I wonder whether we could give people the right to sell their rights. So if, if you believe, let's say, that we've got the exact right paternity pay, maternity pay, um, uh, um, holiday entitlements, God knows what else, um, it doesn't seem to me that you should stand in the way of the worker selling those back to their employer. Uh, perhaps you're a woman who has no, in, no uh, intention of having children or can't have children. Well, uh, you should be able to sell back your maternity rights to your employer. So although you might uh, disagree with what rights workers should be endowed with by the state, maternity pay, paternity pay, the amount of annual leave, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It seems to me that even if you endow the worker with those rights, they should be the workers to trade. And therefore, uh, I would like to see that as an easy flexibility. Here, here's your list of rights, but if you want to negotiate selling them in for a pay rise, then be my guest. I think that would be a, an interesting step towards uh, making things somewhat more flexible. And I can't see any obvious downside for the worker. You don't need to trade if you don't want to, but if you want to, you can. I like the sound of that. Len, do you agree? Do you have any other ideas to give? Uh, I mean, that's an interesting audience? thing because that, uh, people tried to do that uh, about 15 years ago. They tried to sell rights in that way, uh, but they, the, the courts held they couldn't do that. These rights were, were not transferable in that way. But Mark is right. If you create, if, if they were genuine property rights, you could, you, you know, you could sell them on. So that's quite an interesting idea. Um, I, I it's difficult to, to I, I think it's it's really about trying to change the whole direction of what we're doing. Um, but you can pick on a number of things. I, I think we ought to scrap the, 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 the target for the national living wage uh, of reaching 66% of median uh, uh, hourly earnings by 2024. I think we should scrap that. I think we should scrap the apprenticeship levy. I, I think we ought to look very carefully at discrimination law. Um, which groups do we really need? to protect and which do we not because the 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 the, the protected characteristics has now expanded so far that it's difficult to see you know 60 70 percent of the workforce would come under one or other of these headings and that doesn't seem to me to be quite right uh, particularly since uh, a thing we inherited from 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 the european union was that there was no upper limit on a tribunal award for discrimination whereas there is for unfair dismissal and a whole range of other things um, in principle, you can get a, a million, million and a half, whatever, totally, uh, often uh, given because of, of the wish to make some kind of demonstration of a political point rather than any real loss 
on the part of the complainants. So I would I would have another look at discrimination. Very dicey business. So many people to upset, but I think it would be worth doing. Well, we'll, we'll have to finish on that note. Thank you for both of you for your time this evening. Um, thanks a lot for joining me. Um, to our audience, uh, if you enjoyed this, please do give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. You can also read Len's paper, uh, which is on the IEA website, and it's also linked in the description box below. You can also read Mark's article that's out in the Times today. Um, and we've also got a three minute short explainer about how we can create jobs going forward. So uh, please do check all those things out and um, I'll see you next week. Bye.